Welcome everyone to our 2023 Health Policy Speaker Series. Today, I'm delighted to introduce our panel to discuss Medicare's new drug price negotiation program. Uh, we have today Jeremy Balreich, who's in the Department of Health Policy and Management at Johns Hopkins University. Jennifer Bryant, Executive Vice President, Policy and Research in Pharma. And Sean Dixon, Senior Vice President, Pharmaceutical Policy and Strategy at AHIP. I just want to start with a, a preface this all with a couple of comments. I'm first of all, I'm Alison Quayer. I'm a professor in health administration and policy and the associate dean of research here in the Comet College of Public Health at George Mason University. And again, welcome to this webinar. I want to start by saying that this is a complicated topic. Um, the production of drugs is uh, not is a, a simple production function, and the pricing, particularly here in the United States, is particularly complicated. Um, key among the considerations for this particular uh, product is that the research and development costs are high. And so research development costs for a new pharmaceutical agent are estimated to be $3 million on average. Um, and product advertising and R&D in this particular space go hand in hand. So we have investment and marketing that go together. So we get the new products, and we disseminate them widespread in the healthcare system. On top of that, um, we explicitly in the US have a policy through the Hatch-Waxman Act, which has been interpreted in the law as saying, Congress had two, has two conflicting policy objectives, to induce name brand pharmaceutical firms to make investments necessary to develop new drug products, and simultaneously enabling competitors to bring cheaper generic copies of those drugs to market. And we have these two policy goals. We want new drugs, they're very expensive to develop, and we want affordability. Those two are likely to push up against each other, those two policy goals. So what I wanna do is start with Jeremy Balreich and have him give us a bit of the overview of what this new Medicare drug policy, this new price negotiation pro program is likely to look like. It doesn't begin until 2026, but it's in development now um, as um, authorized by the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. Jeremy, would you please take it away? Thank you, Allison, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity and I look forward to a really wonderful discussion. So I have a few slides. Um, so I'm going to start just by laying some um, background and some context regarding Medicare's uh, price negotiation as stipulated by the IRA. So I want to start with some drug pricing context. You know, in the U.S., pharmaceutical spending represents about 15% of total healthcare spending um, in the U.S. Um, oh, I also I see in the chat, if you do have a question, you know, regarding my presentation, go ahead and just drop in the chat. I'd be happy to, to answer a comment. Um, so drug spending is about 15%, or about $600 billion or $1,800 per person in the US. You may see some figures where that's around 400 billion, but that's only looking at drugs at the retail pharmacy. The 600 billion includes retail pharmacy, as well as drugs in the hospital and drugs provided by um, physicians, you know, such as your cancer infusions. Most of our drug spending is on what's called branded drugs. Um, these are drugs that are covered under patents and market exclusivity. They're drugs with branded names. So you could think of Merck's Keytruda, the very popular immunotherapy for cancer. Even though these branded drugs represent around 85% of our spending, they usually only represent somewhere around between 10 and 15% of our prescription fills. The majority of prescriptions that Americans fill are in fact on generic drugs, but generic drugs are much, much lower price. So they represent a much smaller chunk of our spending. I will note that for those who are not familiar, branded drugs will become tomorrow's generics. When branded lose their patents or exclusivity, 
then we have generic drugs and generic competition. Within the branded space, there's a subset called specialty drugs. Medicare defines these as a, drugs that cost over $700 per month, plus or minus. And these specialty drugs have grown in popularity. And now they amount to nearly 50% of prescription drug spending, yet they only account for one to 2% of our prescription fills. So talk, this is a very expensive area of prescription drugs. They've become very popular in, um, in our recent drug launches, probably in the past 10 years or so. And at the same time, they, they have a very out, um, large outsize effect on pharmaceutical spending. Now, when we take a step back and think about Medicare versus the rest of the US drug spending, Medicare Part B and D. So for those who are not familiar, Medicare Part B is your clinical benefit. So if you go to a doctor or a physician, Part B is your Medicare benefit that pays for it. Where Medicare Part D, as in dog, is your drug benefit. That will cover drugs when you go to a pharmacy such as CVS or Walgreens. Well, the combination of Part B and D represent about a third of the pharmaceutical market, you know, plus or minus. And then when we think about how patients actually pay for drugs, so you think about that $1,800 per person, patients pay through drugs two ways. One, we pay through insurance premiums. So your insurance through your employer, through a state-sponsored plan, um, through Medicare, you pay for drugs through a monthly insurance premium. You also pay for drugs when you go to the pharmacy and you fill your prescription. And that's through the cost sharing. And you either have a fixed copay, you know, five, 10, $20, or you pay a coinsurance, which is a percentage of what the drug costs. That coinsurance is often tied with specialty drugs. On this slide, which is from ASPE, which is part of Health uh, Department of Health and Human Services, can kind of highlight some of the changes in specialty drug expenditures from 2016 to 2021. The reason I want to share this slide is because it demonstrates a the growth. You know, from 2016, total specialty spending was around 200 billion. By 2021, six years later that has reached 300 billion, a four, over a 40% chain, 40% growth. When we look at how much spending is on specialty drugs versus overall drug spending, we see within what we call retail spending. So that's when you take a prescription to Walgreens or CVS, retail spending on specialties around 40%. When you think of non-retail spending, so this is when you go to an oncologist or your cancer doctor and they provide a drug at the office for you. Or if you go to other physician specialty offices and they provide a drug at the office, we call that non-retail spending. Specialty drugs account for the majority of drug spending, nearly 70% in 2021. So the past two slides really kind of give some context about how big the pharmaceutical market, where we're spending money within the pharmaceutical, it's mostly on branded drugs. And within branded, it's mostly on specialty drugs. And that has had a significant growth um, in recent years. So given how much we spend, why should we bother negotiating drug prices? Well, according to a recent YouGov and Economist survey, 37% of respondents, which is um, supposed to represent the American public, have indicated that they have not filled a prescription for medicine because of its cost. You know, that survey has been uh, reinforced through other surveys, particularly with the Commonwealth Fund. And this is not a new problem. 
back in 2010, a survey by the Commonwealth Fund, which looked at both America as well as other um, high middle income countries, found that 23% of Americans either did not fill or skipped a prescription because of cost in the past year. And that's over double the average for most comparator countries. And it's even more, you know, if you look at what United Kingdom or the Netherlands in the same survey, they're around 4%. So in America, these high drug costs are preventing patients from accessing these medications. And the National Academy of Medicine, they stated that innovative medicines are not innovative if patients cannot get access to them. And one of the reasons people are skipping out because of cost is because of what we call out-of-pocket cost. A 2022 MD Anderson, which is the big cancer center in Texas, they showed that out-of-pocket costs for cancers increased 15% between 2009 and 2015 reaching nearly $6,000 for many types of cancers. Now this is out of pocket. This is what patients pay at the pharmacy, nearly $6,000. For many Americans, that's a tremendous cost and a very, and can be quite a um, affordability barrier. The other reason or that's often cited for negotiating prices is the sense of international fairness. It's well documented across the healthcare sector that the US pays more for healthcare services than many other countries. This is particularly true when we look at the branded pharmaceutical space. In this study, which was um, done with HHS and ASPE, they looked at the relative prices for branded drugs in the US versus other comparator countries. So here on the graph on the left, we see that Canada had a 294% price differential in the US. What does that mean? It means if a drug costs $100 in Canada, that same drug would cost $294 in the US. If a drug costs $100 in France, that same drug will cost $349 in the US. Essentially, the US American citizens are paying about three times the price of what many other very similar economic performing countries are paying. That naturally raises a question of why are we paying so much more for drugs compared to other countries. So the response from policymakers has been, let's allow CMS to negotiate drug prices. And they do this through the Inflation Reduction Act, which provides legislative authority, in fact, stipulates that CMS has to negotiate drug prices for a set of drugs. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the details um, as framing for our panel discussion. So how does the IRA stipulate negotiations? Well, first, it identifies what drugs are going to be eligible for negotiations. They have to be on the market for at least either seven years if they're a small molecule or 11 years if they're a biologic. The difference of, between small molecule and biologic is how complex the drug is to develop and make. They have some exclusions. Drugs that are developed and marketed by small biotechs are gonna be excluded. Drugs that only treat a orphan or rare disease are gonna be excluded. And drugs that have less than $200 million in annual med Medicare sales will be excluded. In addition, drugs that have either generic or biosimilar competition will also be excluded. Now the drugs are gonna be identified based on their gross spending. That is they wanna negotiate the drugs that cost or that cost Medicare the most money first. 
They'll identify 10 drugs to be negotiated for 26, 2026. They'll identify another 15 drugs in Part D to be negotiated in 2027. And then beginning 2028, they're gonna look at both Part D as in dog, as well as Part B as in boy. And afterwards, they'll negotiate about 20 drugs each year. I will you know, shout out that a fellow panelist, Sean Dixon, he has an excellent paper in the Journal of Managed Care and Pharmacy. If you want to look at what type of drugs are gonna be negotiated each year for the next five years. So what's gonna be the impact of these negotiations? Well, CMS or the IRA stipulates that there's gonna be a maximum fair price. So a company is gonna be negotiating for a price for these drugs, but the price is gonna be capped at a maximum fair price. And that cap is going to be based on what non-federal average manufacturers' prices are. In other words, CMS is going to cap out how much a price for a drug is going to be based on non-Medicare, non-federal um, prices for that drug. Um, and that cap and that percentage discount it's going to be based on how long the drug's been on market. It's been on market between nine and 12 years. It's only 25% discount, 12, 16, 35%. If it's been on the market for at least 16 years, that discount's going to be at least 60%. The law also stipulates there's other considerations for negotiation, such as manufacturer research and development, federal R&D support, comparative effectiveness, and therapeutic alternatives. Now companies, they don't have to negotiate. So if they refuse to negotiate, they will face an excise tax. In other words, they could stay in the Medicare program, but will have a incredibly burdensome tax, or they could actually just withdraw from the Medicare and Medicaid system. And the end result is that CBO, the center, um, the Congressional Budget Office, We'll estimate that drug prices will be about 8% lower in 2030 as if there were compared to the counterfactual of no negotiation. This will result in about $100 billion in 10 year savings. And very controversially, the CBO estimates that there's going to be 1% fewer new drugs. I say that's controversially because you'll hear that this price negotiation will reduce incentives for future drug development. Before I go on next slide, I see Beth asked, how many years do drugs stay on patent? Um, if the drugs need to be seven or 11, well, most generics, you know. So this is a great but Jeremy, question. actually, I'm gonna interrupt. We're gonna take Q&A after everybody's okay. presented, but I think that'll just keep it a little more organized, but thank you. Thank you for keeping awesome. your eye on that, we'll but I'll help moderate that one. Great. Um, on this slide, I just wanna highlight you know, in the first batch, the first 10 drugs are gonna be negotiated. You see, you know, um, a number of drugs for blood clots, but I wanna highlight there's three drugs here for cancer, um, Imbruvica, Ibrance, Extandi. When we look at how much these drugs cost, they're incredibly expensive, nearly $100,000 or more per year per Medicare beneficiary. And this is gonna have a big impact on the patient's out of pocket spending with a negotiated price. Lastly, before the panel discussion, you know, one may ask, well, were there other alternatives? Oops, sorry. Are there other alternatives to drug pricing that we could adopt? And I think that's a great way to think about it. And, you know, Winston Churchill, he had this excellent quote about how democracy is the worst form of government, except all the other forms that have been tried and failed, I kind of feel like this is very similar to drugs pricing. What the IRA does, it's not great in my opinion, but compared to some other alternatives, um, it's probably one of the better options. Other alternatives that have been talked about in the past, international reference pricing, President Trump at the time um, suggested using this. In other words, what the US pays is going to be a reflection of what other countries pay. 
Another variation is domestic reference pricing. So when a new drug comes to the market, its price is going to be capped. There's going to be a function of existing drugs and existing prices on the market. And lastly, another alternative to drug pricing is a value-based price. That is, we'll set a price based on what the value of that drug has. So there are alternative approaches, but the IRA is stipulating what the CMS has um, with their approach first. And thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeremy, so much. And I actually encourage all of you to go ahead and post your questions. It's just that I'll moderate them once our speakers have had a chance to add their comments. And I want to highlight a couple of things because this is a complicated topic, a couple of things that Jeremy um, said or implied. One is that if pharmaceuticals were sold in a single worldwide market under a single authority, this would be an easier problem to solve. Um, the other is that we have brand names because we have patent protection. And we know that when patents expire, generics enter quickly. So there are studies that show the price um, declines by on average 84%. If I looked up those numbers correctly, the average price decline is about 84%. And we know that when that current drug prices are an important determinant, they're not the only de determinant, but an important determinant of already spending and the new number of drugs in the pipeline. So again, this is where these, if you will, balancing concerns are coming in. And the other thing is, is that most other countries that are um, you know, comparable to, to the US are setting their count country level pharmaceutical prices or they're negotiating with their manufacturers through their government entities. Here in the US, we have negotiation with private payers. What we have here under the IRA is a new provision allowing the US government to negotiate prices. Okay. Having highlighted a couple of things from Jeremy's talk, I want to turn it over now to Jenny Bryant from Pharma. Tell us where your, you and your membership are on this topic um, and uh, take it away, please. I'm going to cut my video just for now. Thanks. Um, well, there's a lot to say. I'm, I'm tempted to um, provide a little bit of context to some of um, the data that um, was just presented, um, but I, I want to make sure I have a chance to sort of hit the highlights um, and create, you know, time for, for Sean as well. I think the, the key thing that I would say is that um, regardless what you think about the, the need to set uh, prices for drugs, um, this bill, this, the, the Inflation Reduction Act has been, I think, described by many people as a small and targeted approach to price setting. And I would, uh, I would argue that it's going to have much bigger consequences than are widely appreciated. Um, that because both of the way the law was written and now the way that it's been implemented by CMS, it's actually um, a very aggressive um, approach. And so even people who uh, maybe thought that there should be some price setting will be surprised, I think, by the degree to which the, the result of the, the combination of the law and CMS action is likely to really squash the, um, the competitive system that we've had. Um, you, you referenced, um, uh, Isella, the, uh, the generic and biosimilar markets, which has been our sort of uh, engine for creating cost containment in this country. I think we're going to see that that is really dramatically um, squashed. We are going to see um, unintended, I think, disincentives to develop um, uh, new uses for medicines, and in particular, to develop those new uses <clears throat> or new medicines that rely on um, pills or tablets. There's really a baked in penalty here for the um, for drugs that are uh, that are in tablet or pill form, and then I think you're going to see um, a lot of destabilization in Part D, the benefit that um, Medicare provides to seniors, because the law essentially combines both a private market system that we've had for some time of negotiating prices with a price setting system, um, and the 
interactions between the way that the government sets prices and the way that the um, the health plans are negotiating prices are, are complicated and it's it's not yet clear how that's all going to play out but I think what seems to be uh, seems quite clear is that when the government goes in and sets a price in a therapeutic area where there's lots of competition um, the the consequences, are going to um, touch all of the drugs in that therapeutic class. And so, uh, you know, they might set the price for one drug. And if there are 20 drugs in that class, uh, 19 others will also um, adjust in ways that are not easy to predict. And you will find that the, um, the government is, in essence, kind of picking the, the winners and losers and putting the thumb on the scale about which drugs end up on the formularies of the Part D plans. So <clears throat> um, I think that will play out over the next few years and we'll see how it all works. But um, there's there's a lot to be concerned about here in terms of the um, the ways that uh, we're, we're progressing down the road uh, on price setting. Um, I, th the other thing I think that is important for people to understand is that because the law has been framed as being um, kind of moderate and uh, and not a, a a big solution on drug pricing. And uh, it, 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 for example, um, it was just said that the the law has a minimum discount of twenty five percent for the drugs that are nine years old. That is true. That is how the law is written. But the way that it's going to be implemented and CMS guidance makes us very clear, um, it's going to be essentially impossible for them to. Um, just take a 25% discount on those drugs. They're going to take much deeper discounts, I think, um, reading between the lines of their guidance. It's actually not clear that there's any bottom at all to how big that discount could be. And the political pressures being what they are, I think in this administration and future administrations that are going to continue to face challenges um, in containing entitlement costs, I think you will see um, a lot of uh, pressure to find the lowest possible price, which could be just above the cost of production. So um, <clears throat> that's a, an example of how we, we sort of talk about it as a 25% discount. But I think when you see what happens, it will it will be really um, much, much more egregious. Um, another misconception about the law, I think, is that um, we keep talking about it as though it's negotiation. But the reality is that this, uh, even though we might want that to be the case, that isn't the way that the government operates. It isn't the way that um, prices get um, determined in Medicare for hospitals or physician care. They aren't negotiated. Um, and they're not going to be negotiated here either because the tax um, that Jeremy just said a manufacturer might pay is actually so high that uh, CBO and all the experts acknowledge that no one will ever pay that tax. In fact, because no one would ever pay that tax, they had to change the law at the end to say, well, so if you don't, you know, another penalty would be if you decide that uh, you don't want to pay this tax, then you could just withdraw from uh, all your products from Medicare and Medicaid, which is essentially, you know, more than half the market. So I, I think uh, manufacturers will need to accept the price that the government proposes. Uh, there's really no um, reason that the CMS uh, would need to, um, really in fact negotiate so this is a it's a price setting exercise um and and that you know price setting happens in many places in many ways but the, the particular way that we think the cms is going to do this uh is going to create enormous amount of uncertainty and when you think about what industry uh needs here uh, the the big challenge for drug manufacturers is that they are uh investing in projects that might pay off in 20 years. This, it's an it's a industry with intense amount of risk. And the problem in price setting is not simply that the prices will be lower. The problem is that the prices are unknown and there is some chance, not quantifiable at this stage, that uh, a future government agency could decide to make the price or the return essentially zero. So it's the unpredictability associated with price setting and the concern that the whole process could become politicized that is just as important as the fact that the prices will be lower. Um, in a business that's all about risk, this is an extra measure of risk that is really um, very, very hard to, to manage. So why do the misperceptions about the law even matter? I think the reason 
that they matter is that if you have the uh, the if you come into this with the mental model that this is a very small bill, a small uh, change that's not going to solve problems, then you're looking for bigger solutions. And we already see before the ink is dried, before the first set of drugs has been announced for negotiation, that the uh, Congress is looking at much bigger proposals. The administration said, now we need to double the number of drugs and we need to you know, create much bigger savings because what we have done is not enough. Again, it's not even started. We haven't even seen the consequences of the first set of drugs, but they're already talking about um, essentially uh, doubling uh, the scale of the impact and moving the time frame up to start price setting at five years, which I think on its face essentially eliminates the biosimilar industry and the potential to um, to introduce generics. So they sort of just, you know, <laughs> it. it the uh, the scale of the new proposals less than a year later is kind of mind boggling. And at the same time, you have other proposals to take the uh, the price setting of the law, apply it to the commercial market. And we see the states trying to stand on the shoulders and apply price setting to different groups of drugs. So I will say that a year ago, when we were talking about the IRA, and I said, this is sort of a decision that Congress is making that's putting us on a path so that we'll look more like those European systems where the government really chooses the drugs that you can take. I was seen as hyperbolic, like that's crazy. That's This is a very modest proposal and it's just this. Well, it's clear a year later, it's not just this, right? A year later, we have 28 members of Congress in the Senate saying, no, actually we want to start price setting at five years, which the process begins at year three by the way, you pick the drugs at year three and then you would um, set the price at year five. Thank so you. I, I don't think it was hyperbolic. Um, right. So I, I can stop there and we can, we can I think so. If you, and then I, I think we, let's have a, have a nice exchange. I think you raised some interesting additional dimensions, which are sort of the, the political dynamic dimensions separate from the economic ones related to um, innovation and competition. I wonder, Sean, if you could uh, jump in here because where we've had negotiation up till now, it's been in private insurance. Um, tell us a little bit about what we learned there. Why, despite negotiation in the private industry, do we still have very high prices? We have employers invented PBMs. You know, what 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 is our experience been there? And if you don't mind saying a little bit about you have Medicare Advantage plans under your member uh, as well. Sort of what are they looking towards? There's a you know there's a lot of oncology drugs here. There's some around by diabetes. Are they um, how are they thinking about that in terms of how it might change care delivery? And anything else you want to add? <laughs> sure. Well, well, thank you, Allison. And in 12 thank minutes. You, um, uh, everyone for your comments. Um, I first want to note that in talking about any of the impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act and Medicare negotiation, I'm not um, on behalf of AHIP stating an endorsement or rejection of any of those, but simply explaining sort of what is happening and how we're thinking about it. Um, before I talk about some of the plan specific issues, though, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the market dynamics that sort of brought us to this space. Um, you know, when the, the IRA was being proposed and in the earlier versions like HR3, there was a lot of conversation about how they were trying to mimic some of the pricing differences that were observed, um, as Jeremy pointed out, when generics are entering the market. And one of the reasons for um, wanting to, to try and have that market dynamic happen at a different point in time is that we've seen substantial creep in how long it takes for generic competition to, to enter the market over time. Um, in the 1990s, for high spend sort of blockbuster drugs, those um, um, over, I think, 250 million in annual spending, uh, the generic introduction is happening in about 10 years after the drug was initially approved. And by 2010, that had crept up to 13 years and seems to be increasing uh, even now. Now that three years may not seem very long, that's an additional 30% of the time that we're paying monopoly prices for drugs. And that certainly has an impact on spending. Um, one of the other parts of the Inflation Reduction Act that hasn't necessarily been talked about in as much detail here are the restrictions or the, the attempts to limit price increases over time. And I think, excuse me, as we think about the implications of that over the long term, it's important to think about what happens with price increases and how they set costs for future drugs. So taking, for example, excuse me, um, a drug in the HIV space, um, Strybil, a revolutionary drug um, uh, uh, that took substantial price increases year over year in large part because of the need for that drug, there wasn't really any ability for uh, insurers to negotiate a lower price given how essential it was to treatment. And so those price increases were actually driving higher costs over time. 
Um, by about 10 years later, when the successor product, Genvoyo, which is a very small change to the molecule, was introduced, um, that drug had almost doubled in price from its launch price. And that successor product was launched at the exact same list price to, to put it at parity. And so the question is, what sort of creep have we had over time, even on drugs that may have substantial rebates that are negotiated by PBMs and plans? And how would that world be different if we were um, to sort of change the curve and bend that curve lower so that new drugs aren't launching as at high of prices as the market has previously set through some of these increased behaviors? Um, I also want to note that it, it's important to recognize when we're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act and markets here, that this is only applying to the Medicare market in terms of where these prices will be available. And so there will still be substantial opportunity for higher prices in the commercial market. And, and, and you know, that's about half of the market um, as it is. Uh, government is about half the market overall, but it's split between Medicare and Medicaid, and then the commercial market has a substantial portion. And so this is not going to be necessarily affecting the prices that are available in that market or changing the negotiation structure there. I also want to note that when we think about a negotiated price and what how that affects what PBMs and plans are doing to negotiate the price of other drugs in the therapeutic class, we want to think about that as analogous to whether or not that drug had become generic at that point in time. Because if that drug had become generic at that point in time and, and come in at a lower price, then PBMs would also be negotiating with the other drugs in the therapeutic class relative to that generic price. So if we're thinking about what has happened in the Inflation Reduction Act is trying to advance the timing of generic type pricing into the market, then we're not necessarily forcing um, therapeutic competitors to lower their price in an artificial way. They were forcing them to compete with a generic price just at an earlier point in time. And that price is then indexed to the brand product, at least in the Medicare market. So I think these are just some points to, to think about overall, what this is doing, which markets it's affecting, and sort of what types of problems Congress was attempting to solve for here. Um, what this bill hasn't done is actually affect any of these things that, that, that bring in generic competition, like addressing the role of patents in, um, in, in delaying competition, uh, a variety of other strategies in terms of you know, pursuing additional exclusivities, intentionally delaying when you're going to launch a new study of a product so that you can get an extra two to five years of FDA exclusivity and sort of um, discourage generics from entering. This doesn't fix any of those underlying issues. It's just addressing it with price and it's just addressing it in the Medicare program. So I think that's really important to consider. You know, as I don't want to speak on behalf of any of our plans in particular for how they're thinking, because many of them have different opinions depending on their, their business model and which markets they operate in. But what we're doing right now is really focusing on sort of the implementation, um, not necessarily the negotiated prices themselves, but the, the attendant benefit design changes. So what was important is, you know, one of the concerns was that older adults were unable to afford some of their medications. Um, Jeremy pointed out some of the, the challenges there. And so the Medicare Part D benefit design was changed to have an out-of-pocket cap for the first time and the ability to smooth costs over time. Those are operationally very challenging and very significant changes to the Medicare Part D benefit design. And so a lot of the work has been done about how to implement those. Um, but the negotiation process overall was really in many ways about financing those changes to the benefit design, financing a more generous package for older adults. And so now we're working on, on the implementation associated with that. Um, I'll leave some time for questions, but I uh, appreciate the sure. opportunity to be here and sure. turn back to Allison. Terrific. Thank you so much. And this is really a difficult topic and very reasonable, intelligent people can have different views. And there's just lots of uncertainty and it'll be interesting to track how this impacts um, a lot of outcomes that are important in the healthcare policy and delivery space. We do have a couple of questions that I think they're fair. Um, and Jeremy, perhaps you can help me unpack them. Uh, so we get brand name drugs because we have patents, but we when do the generics appear? Um, and where what is this delay in the generics all about? Because it seems like if the generics could hit the market sooner, then that introduces the competition sooner, right? That doesn't seem to be happening you were indicating in your slides. What, what's happening there? Yeah, so I, I think Sean hit a little bit about this. Um, in the 90s, when a lot of drugs were molecularly more simple, um, pants ran out faster, or pants, you know, a typical pants, 14 years, you get the pant while it's still in development mode, and you have seven years typical of exclusivity. With the increase of particularly more molecularly complex molecules, especially in biologics, companies have been able to identify new ways to manufacture that biologic, new ways to have some differences in that underlying molecule, thereby extending their pan life. They may apply for additional pan while the drug's already on the market. A great poster child of this type of 
Behaviors Humira, which used to be the best-selling drug in the U.S. Um, and Humira has been, was first approved on market maybe in 2002. Uh, I might be off by a year or two there. Um, and it is just now facing biosimilar competition. So been on the market for over 20 years, has generated uh, probably over $100 billion of revenue for AbbVie. Um, it's experienced generic competition or biosimilar competition in Europe. Yeah, in the US, we are still paying fairly high prices for Humira. And it is partially because of what we call patent evergreening, patent thickening, thickets, other types of games that have been able to extend the life of a branded drug. Can I Thank you for that. Of course, please jump in because it, it also sounds like um, we have other examples. You, there was an insulin on your list. So there must be something about that insulin that's on your list that's particularly special if it's on the high price. Because this insulin has been around a long time. So it must be offering something that's of value to the purchaser. But Jenny, please, did you want to respond to Jeremy? Uh, well, so you raised insulin as like a completely different point. I, I, I guess I, I would... Um, I think I would make two points to try to make them quickly that the biosimilar market in the US was many years behind the European market. It took us a longer time kindly to set up a biosimilar market and we're just now really beginning to see the fruit. So the example of Humira, um, I, I understand, I think is highly like unlikely to be repeated in the future. That was true prior to the IRA and now it simply, it, it, it could never occur again. So. I think what we need to look at is like going forward, um, what the system's gonna look like and not just, um, I mean, that drug is used as a poster child of um, frequently for these discussions, but um, we're not gonna face that type of problem uh, again, I think. Um, so the biosimilar market now, I'm, I'm concerned, the IRA is really um, gonna dent the ability of the generics and biosimilars to bring the competition that we've had in the past. And the proposals on the table, if you don't think IRA goes far enough, are going to just completely throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? So I think that um, to say that this is just a Medicare um, uh, proposal and not commercial kind of misses the point that zillions of states now have drug affordability boards that are going to reference the price that Medicare sets. There's going to be an interaction there. Like um, we've kind of unleashed a genie. It's not going back into the bottle. So I, I think that um, that that really underplays uh, the degree to which that the entire system that's given us the level of innovation we've had to date is under attack. Right. And you heard Jeremy, well, you heard Sean say, well, we haven't dealt with the patent issue, so we should go there too. And I think that I just would urge people to step back and think about like understanding the consequences of the steps that have been taken before we uh, go a lot farther. And I, I would then I just want to make a separate point related to insulins, which is that one of the big changes we've seen in the market over the last, um, uh, I guess, maybe. Uh, seven to 10 years is actually just the growth of what you can't really call anything other than arbitrage, which is the uh, huge dollars that are following the incentives for everyone in the supply chain up to and including the PBMs and the insurers to uh, ride the tide of rising list prices. So there've been a series of negative incentives that mean that everybody, including health plans, PBMs, pharmacies, uh, hospitals, especially hospitals, all make more money when they use more expensive list price drugs. So list prices have gone up and net prices are actually what you want to look at. Those were flat, for example, last year. And in the last, um, really the last decade, uh, the U.S. has continued to spend 15% on drugs total. Like that hasn't changed. What changes the character of that spending, as was pointed out, it's now much more specialty. But 50 cents out of every dollar spent on brands, including specialty, is going to somebody else who doesn't make that drug. And part of that, candidly, is the hospitals with 400% markups, who literally take the $1,000 drug and charge the patient $4,000 because they can. And so some of the 
craziness in the pharmaceutical market is associated with markups and incentives that are distorted. And I would argue that also very unfinished business wasn't even touched in the IRA and we need to get to that. And I would argue fixing those competition problems is where we should have gone before we start going to much, much more aggressive price setting. And I'm guessing that Sean and I would even agree on that. <laughs> and we promised our audience this is a complicated topic and this is precisely why it is so complicated. Sean, can you shed some light on why it's so hard for private insurers to get their arms around some of these prices? Well, sure. I mean, I think one of the, the there are a couple of things that Jenny mentioned that are that are important to, to talk about. So right, you have a number of therapeutic classes where there just isn't actual competition with the drugs or for you know medical reasons, we can't necessarily prefer one drug over another. And in those cases, we don't see significant um, discounting and, and price increases over time are reflected in higher spending over time. And that's different than example like the insulin class um, that Jenny mentioned, where we do have uh, net prices actually falling over time. And and you know, one of the, the we, we talk about this disparity between the list price and the net price. And one of the challenges is, is that the market um, absent any, and all markets are always going to favor a higher list price with a negotiated discount. Um, the Department of Justice has put out some work on this, talking about how, excuse me, it's a natural equilibrium when you have a limited number of producers and uh, um, purchasers that are able to negotiate in secret, that you are always incented to go to the individual at the highest list price to negotiate a discount because you're using any lower list price as a backstop in negotiation. Um, and as you say, if I you know if you can't beat this price, then I'll go buy from this other guy over here. And so what that means is there's always an incentive to take lockstep uh, high list price increases to try and make yourself more competitive relative to competitors. This is not something that's just a feature of the pharmaceutical market. And that's why, again, it's really important to have negotiation to try and bring down those prices um, and payer-based negotiation, excuse me, to try and bring down those prices. Does this explain this phenomenon that GoodRx is getting better prices? What better prices is GoodRx getting? Well, GoodRx is um, uh, uh, basically buying discounts from, um, from pharmacy benefit managers that they're negotiating on behalf of their institutional insurance clients, and then providing a portion of that discount to individuals who are paying outside of their insurance benefit. So, you know, it's, it's, unfor it's an unfortunate situation where an individual um, is paying more in cash um, sort of upfront than they may over the course of the entire year if they had used their insurance benefit. But the nature of the insurance benefit based upon actuarial value standards that were required to meet based upon an, an employer or plan sponsor's preference for a higher deductible plan that may shift more costs um, out of premiums and onto individuals is just the nature of that benefit design. And so that's why you've actually seen a lot of innovation of trying to take Wow. drugs that are sort of maintenance drugs, drugs that are really important and move them into a cost sharing model or a copay model, um, even during the, the deductible phase of the benefit design to sort of smooth that out over the course of the year. And then right. we have well, this sort just of- To make that a little simpler, like what's going mm -hmm. on in a case like insulin is that you have for, a, for every hundred dollars of spending, there's a, the, the insurer is paying actually $20 and there's $80 going back to the payers as a discount. So the, the, the discount is ginormous. And so a patient who uses like Cubans, you know, Mark, I don't know if they're doing insulins yet, but this, this applies in, for other classes too. And for generics, a, a patient who is taking a highly rebated drug is often better off with GoodRx or with Mark Cubans because what's happening is if they buy through their insurance benefit, the insurer or their employer is taking those rebates and applying them to the premium to keep premiums low for everyone, but they're not sharing those discounts directly with the patient taking that drug. So we do have a situation where the patients who have chronic conditions, which are often those medicines that are carrying the largest rebates are being disadvantaged by today's system because they don't get the benefit of those discounts that are in the system negotiated by their insurer, but their insurer isn't required to share those savings with that um, that patient. So I think that's that's what Sean was saying, but in a little bit um, different way. Yeah. And so I think I think that's fair. I just wonder, Jeremy, if you could shed light on this. If we compare what good RX is quote negotiating to what Medicare might be negotiating, and we're thinking about prices, but we're also thinking about innovation incentives and preserving the way our other laws require um, innovation incentives. Is the Medicare negotiation going to look anything like good RX? Just simply put. Uh, no, not, I don't think so. Not, not necessarily. I mean, good, 
it should also be noted that Medicare beneficiaries often cannot use the GoodRx discount cards. So I think GoodRx has a role within specific markets, but I think the way CMS and Medicare price negotiations, it's a different thing versus how GoodRx and their business model with PBMs work. Well, we had, we had this, I would say some, the simple answer to that is when the government sets the price under the IRA and they negotiate, and they're not negotiating, they're setting, but like they set that price, then the patient will get that price. The law is very clear. Like if the, right. if the price was $100 before and Medicare says it's now 40, the patient will be charged 40. But in Medicare, it will still be the case that if the price is $100 and your insurer, your Part D plan negotiates a price that's 30 in your deductible, you will still pay 100. All right, so this I'm is the to... complication with the mm -hmm. rebates. Go ahead, Jeremy, if you want to I respond. Think... And then there was another I, I think, Jenny, I, I think CMS is still on the rulemaking. I have mm -hmm. to disagree with that point. I think price negotiations will have a price effect at point of sale. So if no, the government- price negotiations will, but not the, the there's no rebate pass through in in Medicare. I don't think there's and there's nothing in the CMS guidance that implies that they will do that for the non price no. negotiated. So before drugs. we go way over our audience's heads, I just do want to explain that this is, is still in the proposed rulemaking phase, right? Um, so we're we're still working out the details. Some of this we may may not have have set in stone yet. That said, we have a basic question, which is how are prices on specialty drugs set today? Well, the price is obviously set at whatever is going to be the most profitable for the owner of that drug, right? And, and we would expect that. I'm, I'm not where nobody is nobody is critiquing the idea that this is a profit-making industry. If a drug is valuable, um, and we've given them a patent, benefit. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. except mm -hmm. a manufacturer, yeah. Um, the question is, you know, is there some ability to negotiate that price against another drug or another therapeutic option? And that's where insurers and PBMs have really stepped in. And one of the challenges, right, there's been this push to say, why can't we just have those price negotiations happen at the at the list price of the drug? And and some people will point to some litigation in the 90s and class action settlements, but the, it's more of a supply chain issue. Because when you have a pharmacy, right, that has serving people with different insurance plans, they can't acquire the exact same drug at five different prices, depending on whether it's, you know, on a lower tier on one formulary versus another. And the insurer needs to reimburse the pharmacy for the amount that they paid for the drug from the wholesaler. And so the only way to effectively negotiate and price discriminate on a volume based basis is to do it retrospectively. And that's really where we've gotten into this situation. Okay, thank you. Jamie, you, you, you put up on your slide um, this notion that out-of-pocket costs are, are high for many patients for, for some of these drugs. Um, and some of that's gonna be deductibles are high. So are the prices gonna come down enough to make a difference in the out-of-pocket costs? Well, I think this uh, taking a step back and rec recognizing that there's the price negotiation, but there's also a lot of changes to the Part D benefit design in the IRA. In fact, many of the changes are gonna be beneficial um, for both pharmaceutical industry as well as patients. They have a $2,000 maximum out of pocket cap you know, for individual patients. So I do think you know, um, Medicare beneficiaries on the whole will be better off following IRA implementation because of changes in benefit design as well as the negotiation. You know, we can't kid ourselves that there's gonna be, there will be trade-offs related to negotiation, but there will also be trade-offs related to the benefit redesign. In fact, even Eli Lilly this morning said that the benefit redesign is going to lead to a greater demand for a lot of their branded products. So I, I think there's, for beneficiaries, changing the insurance structure, that benefit design will be on the whole a lot better, especially following 2025. Right, and that's an important point for our audience, which a couple of you made is that this legislation does multiple things. It doesn't just introduce the price negotiation program for Medicare, which would be the first time our US government would be negotiating drug prices. We did have a question about, um, is there any risk that generics won't enter? Is any of this gonna uh, affect generic entry? 
Well, I think there's a couple of ways to think about that, right? One is, um, as Jenny pointed out, in the European market where there is price setting, we actually have seen biosimilars enter much earlier than they do in the US. And part of that is because of our uh, regulatory system, but there is still a market for lower price products, even when their price is directly negotiated. It's also important to recognize that again, those incentives will still be there um, in the Medicare market, but also importantly in the commercial market, right? There will be substantial cost savings and substantial opportunity to have your generic product be preferenced in the commercial market, even if there's a lower price available in the Medicare market. Um, the other important point to realize is that if manufacturers want to opt out of having their drugs subject to a lower negotiated price uh, or, or, or capped price, um, they can allow a generic or a biosimilar to come to market and they can attempt to compete with it on price as well. That will exempt them from being subject to the negotiation process. So both in terms of the broader market, um, um, even with negotiated prices, we've seen evidence of generic and biosimilar entry in Europe. Um, we have the non-Medicare market that won't have any price restrictions on these drugs and therefore a lot of competition and also the incentive to allow a generic to come to market so that you can then negotiate or compete with it on price. All of those are baked into the IRA. It looked like from the um, list of drugs in a, in a conversation I was having with Jeremy prior to this, so the drugs that might be negotiated, these are uh, um, very much sort of your older individuals, or, um, possibly people who are under 65 who let's say have cancer or on um, disability, um, but it doesn't, what do we think is the impact going to be for Medicaid, where the, the population composition is different, the Medicaid medication distribution is different, we have higher rates of mental illness, for example, in the Medicaid population. So what do we think the impact is going to be on Medicaid? Jenny, you made the important point, it might be one where this idea disseminates to Medicaid, but the, without Medicaid changing, what do we think the Medicaid impact might be? So Medicaid actually does get the benefit of the negotiated price in Medicare. Um, it's complicated, the, the, but the formula that generates the price in Medicaid will reflect the negotiations. So Medicaid will get the benefit of this. Excellent, excellent. For the drugs for which are done, that are sort of salient for the Medicaid population. Definitely, excellent. All right, and then I think we had one other question, which is sort of an institutional fact. How is it other countries are able to negotiate lower prices? It's their laws, but what, what does that look like? It's usually their government's doing it. How does how did some of their negotiation parameters differ? Um, uh, any of you, any one person want to jump on that one? If you took, picked a comparison country, what might it be? What might some of the big parameters be that are different? So yeah. no, there's, a, there's a, go ahead. I'd say you could look at United Kingdom, the UK, NHS, single payer, they use basically adopted value-based pricing framework. And within that framework, there is a, there is a trade-off between access and affordability. For, and it is really um, salient in the cancer space. In the UK, if you have a cancer drug come to market, you have to show it is 20, 30 pounds, 20, 30,000 pounds per quality adjusted life year. Don't want to get too technical on cost effectiveness as part of their decision-making process. But studies have shown that there's been, that's more restrictive to get access to cancer drugs in the UK compared to the US. Now we spend a lot more on the cancer market in the US. The question is, you know, do we have better outcomes because of that? Are we getting, you know, what, what type of drugs are we not getting access to in the UK compared to the US? Other countries, you know, Germany has a different approach you could come to the market with a drug and then you have to demonstrate a therapeutic benefit after so many years or face, you know, uh, a form of a government rebate. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of countries, France also has a health technology assessment type approach where they won't look at how much better in terms of a, um, re, in terms of a therapeutic benefit does a drug offer coming to the market. Um, and excellent. Yeah. And there's, in other words, there were a lot of options, a lot of directions the government could, could, could have gone to resolve this, what they viewed as a high drug price issue. Um, and they could have gone at it from patent law, competition law. They chose a ne price negotiation, and there were many, many, many versions of that we might have attempted. But here is our policy experiment, and we will see what it means. I think that we can all agree that there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of interest. Um, these are, are, could be reasonably high stakes. Um, there are the, very 
high, high stakes here. I mean, I think the trade-offs are pretty clear. Take a good system like France. They tend to wait two years longer for new medicines than we do here. In Australia, a place that um, is otherwise, you know, uh, a very advanced uh, economy, they have about 34% of the new medicines launched in the last decade. So right. there, there are big, right. you know, there are trade-offs, and I think that is, you know, the direction if we t continue to go down the price setting path, we'll end up probably with a system that's much more restricted. Well, thank you so much, all three of you, for joining this panel and for helping shed light on this very complicated topic. It's a, a brand new space, really, literally brand new space in health policy. And I really appreciate your participating and answering our questions. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity.